Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, my name is Alia. I have a master's degree in aerospace engineering and I make videos on aerospace engineering related topics every Thursday. Today, we'll talk about how an aircraft generates lift. And if you watched my last video here, you will probably know that there's no one simple theory that can explain everything. In this video, I'll explain the principle behind the most accepted theory of how an aircraft gets lift and is able to fly. If we want to describe it in general terms or layman terms, it goes like this. When the aircraft and respectively its airfoil is moving through the air, because of the specific shape of this airfoil, the air that goes around it is pushed downwards once it leaves the trailing edge. So this air was flowing straight, but after the airfoil, it's moving downwards. So it feels like some kind of force is pushing it downwards. Now, if you remember the conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum principles, you know that nothing happens in this world out of nowhere. So if this air experiences some force downwards, that means there has to exist another force that balances it upwards. And we call this force lift. This is essentially Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now let's talk about a few cases where we don't have a perfectly streamlined airflow around the airflow. Let's say we get a little bit of separation on top of the airflow, but we still know that the bottom airflow is still pushed downwards. So the major direction of the airflow is still downwards. So this principle will still work. Now you might ask, why is the bottom airflow is still going downwards, even though we get a little bit of separation? Why is that bottom airflow is not going around the corner and joining that airflow? And the reason is the kata condition, which means that, which states that fluids cannot go around sharp corners. They cannot turn in the direction where the force potential is pushing them the opposite way. So you, you can think about it as a river or a little stream, and let's say it has a stone. The river is not going to flow around the stone, it's just going to keep straight in the direction of the incline. Same thing happens with the airflow. And as I explained before, we still get this major downward push of the airflow. All right, what if we have a large separation? And you probably know that when most of the air separates from the airfoil, we don't get as much lift anymore. Why does that happen? Well, because the top part of the airflow is not contributing to that downwards force. So the bottom part is still working, but the top is one half of the whole flow is not contributing anymore. So the lift decreases. And remember from critical angles of attack is where we can get stall. In the scope of this video, this topic is pretty complicated. So I'll probably make another video dedicated entirely to large separation on the top of the airflow. All right, now you might ask, but what about flat airfoils and paper airplanes? They still can fly. So that means they have to push the air downwards too, according to this theory that we're explaining here. And it's true, but if you throw the paper airplane straight, it's just gonna go down and you can test that. So what we need for that is an angle of attack. Now the flat airfoil or the paper airplane at some angle of attack is still gonna push the air downwards which will change its momentum, which we'll describe in a second, and create lift. So flat airfoils and hang gliders, they need a specific angle of attack to produce the highest lift possible for their configuration, for the longest flight. All right, now if we want to get more specific about the situation and describe it with some kind of equation or anything like that, we have to turn to Newton's second law. And Newton's second law was also mentioned in my last video, um, which goes like F equals MA. So the net force acting on an object is equal to mass of this object times acceleration. 
and notice that the force and the acceleration are ve in vector form, which means that the direction of the force affects the direction of acceleration. And you probably solved simple physics problems like that in 8th grade or something. <laughs> Let's take another step and express acceleration as a change of velocity over time, which is what it is by definition. And velocity is also a vector. So we keep the mass inside the bracket because the mass is changing. Here, you might think that we can take out the mass outside the bracket, but that's not actually the case because we are not talking about the total volume of air that's around the aircraft, but we are talking about the control volume around the airflow and how the airflow changes its momentum inside that control volume. So remember from the principle of continuity that every second some air leaves that control volume and some air enters it. And so the difference between those two parts is the change of momentum. So basically this equation tells us that the net force acting on the airflow and the opposing force that, that's acting on the aircraft is proportional to the change of momentum of air in the control volume. So what two basic conclusions can we make from this formula? The first simple conclusion or hint is that the higher the velocity of air, the more momentum change we're going to experience every second. Because if we have high velocity, every second we are getting a lot of air into our control volume and a lot of air is leaving, so the difference becomes big when we have high velocities. And this is why we want to fly at higher speeds to increase the lift. The second simple conclusion that we can make is to notice the vector form of this equation, which means that if we change the velocity vector a lot, that means we'll get more force. And we can change velocity by magnitude, which has its limits, because there's only so much that we can increase the speed by. But the other hint is that we can change velocity by direction. So the more we curve the flow around the airfoil, the more change in the velocity vector we'll get. So this is why we want to increase the angle of attack as much as possible so that we get the maximum possible change of velocity vector, which will give us the maximum possible change of momentum, which will affect the force and the lift. So basically the conclusion here is that we want to change the momentum of this airflow around the airfoil to get the maximum possible lift. Okay, so this was a basic explanation of the theory behind how the aircraft produces lift. And if this video was useful for you and interesting at some point, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to watch more lessons like these in the future. Also, don't forget to hit that bell. And if you're interested in more details about how the aircraft produces lift, which theories exist, which ones are correct, incorrect, what problems we have with explaining lift, then I think this video from the University of Michigan Engineering is the best discussion out there on YouTube. You can also check some of my other videos here. And thank you so much for watching. See you in the next one.